cabinet of curiosities what a mm. wonderful collection of uh horror i'm gonna call them mini movies at this point i mean they're all yeah, they definitely felt like that yeah yeah uh, and i so i was reading that guillermo had handpicked all of the filmmakers involved with this uh and so i'm curious you know how did it come about for you to be a part of this one you know it was it was just that that phone call <laughs> really it was guillermo got in touch with me and uh told me that he had liked my film the vigil and he asked he asked me to do an episode and of course it was like you know dream come true time where it was you know humbling and i just of course i said yes right away and he said okay let me send you the episode that i think i think i want you to do um so he sent me the script for pickman's model i was in canada already at the time i was in toronto already filming something so um you know, we started going back and forth on it. And, you know, the, the wonderful thing with Guillermo is I'm sure every dire director who's part of this is going to talk about is that he kind of gave us free reign to kind of make it our own. And, and each episode has that feel, you know, different camera packages, different post-production stuff, different, uh, just different feels and different moods. And uh, a lot of that was Guillermo kind of letting us have free reign, but also guiding and giving us his kind of master class in directing. So were you very familiar with the, because uh, I believe this is a Lovecraft short story, were you yep. familiar with the source material prior to coming on uh, for the episode? Yeah, yeah, I'd uh, read it as a kid. So I, I kind of, I knew it in and out and it was, you know, it's a short story. And, and I, but by that, I mean, it's actually really short. It's, you know, it's I think less than 10 pages. Um, so it was, the question was, well, how do you expand that? How do you make that something, uh, that's a full episode. And, uh, I was really pleased with kind of uh, the script when I first got it, that, that Lee Patterson wrote, um, expanding this story, but yeah, it's a, it was one I was familiar with. It's been adapted before, um, back in the sixties, late sixties with night gallery. I mean, okay. um, so it's fun to kind of do, do my take on that. So what was then your biggest goal in bringing this short story to life, especially in comparison to the the prior adaptation? Yeah, for me, it was kind of bringing in my own ideas about, you know, it's about art and about the, you know, kind of art and darkness and the things underneath the paintings, like you see right back here is one of the Pikmin paintings. Um, and so for me, it was kind of like, how do I kind of explore some ideas that I had about art? And one of them being art as viral or infectious, kind of like a early 1900s video drone. Like, how could I do something with that? So that was one idea that came from, from the artwork. And the other thing was this concept that we kind of lay out in the episode, particularly with Ben Barnes's character, um, about how if you're always trying to find the beauty in the world and the light in the world and you ignore the darkness, um, then you're probably in for a very rough, rude awakening and a fall. At the same time, if you're obsessed with the decay and the decrepitude and depravity of the world and all the dark, um, you'll lose your mind and your soul. So those were the ideas that we're really playing with in it. I love that video drum reference, by the way. That is now that, <laughs> now that you've put that out there, I'm like, I can I can feel it now. I see it. <laughs> right. Um, so speaking of Ben, though, I mean, this this whole special was perfectly cast, but Ben and Crispin are, are of course the key in really selling this this episode. So how challenging was it for you to find the perfect two people to play these characters? Yeah, I mean, it was the the, the key, I think, was in terms of uh, casting them opposite each other and the kind of how that, that dynamic, um, you know, I think it's easy to think crazy, insane artist and think Crispin. <laughs> I mean, that's just kind of, you know, uh, it comes with the territory in some ways, but, um, you know, for Crispin's role for Pikmin, I really, we wanted somebody who understood art, uh, and, and kind of understood the, the, the making of it and, these ideas underneath and, and Crispin really got that. And he has a lot of experience making his own films and, you know, doing his own stuff. Um, and then he always, he just has this sort of, you know, personality that is both very magnetic and, and very strange uh, in terms of kind of his performance. Um, so it was in, in thinking of that and then thinking of a Thurber and how we, you know, 
how we set them apart. Uh, with Ben, it was really, he just really deeply understood this sort of character and where this character was coming from in terms of how he wants to live his life, how he wants to view the world, what he wants to believe in, and how Pickman, Crispin's character, challenges all of that. Um, and, you know, it was, it was it was great working with both of them. We spent a lot of time talking through characters and stuff. Ben and I would hang out on the weekends and just go over our dialogue and the lines and kind of what we we're looking for. And they just threw themselves in it fully. Well, that's wonderful to hear. That's always what you want from a collaborative experience. Such yeah, as yeah. Um, so what was it then like finding the look of this episode? I mean, I love so much of the style in this, especially that one sequence of Ben nearly stabbing himself in the face as the shadows are setting in. <laughs> such a haunting right. visual style what was it like finding that, that look for it yeah i worked closely with colin uh the dp um and tamara the production designer uh to really we wanted different feelings for different times in which things are taking place which also meant a different kind of look in terms of color grading and the the way those things felt but for me i i always wanted to play with this idea that it's possible that what Thurber is experiencing is in his head. Um, and so I, I wanted it to be, you know, somewhat subjective with what we're seeing. One of the big pieces of that was the paintings. Um, I never really wanted to see them in full. So in that sequence where Ben is almost cutting his head, um, the painting that we're seeing, the little glimpses of it, it's actually several different paintings um, and they're being manipulated constantly and it, we're playing around a lot with, so that the audience really doesn't know what it is. We're just getting bits and pieces of, we know it's awful, whatever it is, but I want it to be very subjective for Ben that we're in his head. Um, and at the same time, be able to cut out of that moment and reveal that, you know, he's just kind of losing it. Well, I certainly got that feel because I, I uh, especially near the end, I kept asking myself, I wonder if this is any of this actually <laughs> happening. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's also the, the nature of a Lovecraft story, right? You're always wondering. Right. If You're always kind of questioning. Happen. And, uh, you know, it's that, that right, that whole idea of um, how much of the, what you're seeing and experiencing is real. And if it is real, like, oh, no, <laughs> like this is this is terrible. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, and then speaking of Lovecraft, I mean, you can't have a story of his without some kind of <laughs> elder being in there of some sort. And I mean, the, the creatures that are in this are horrifying to look at in a great way. Um, how did that, you know, how did those designs come about? Was that from the short? Was that or the, the sor source material? Was that you? How did that come about? You know, it was it was quite a mix. So in the original uh, Lovecraft short story, uh, you know, the ghoul, for example, is described as like canine like. Um, and when we first started working on this project, Guillermo, because he loves his monsters, was very, very involved in kind of the development and look of the ghoul. Um, so, you know, he he had said early on, he's like, Keith, please, like, if there's one thing you let me do, can I please design this, the ghoul? And what, what am I going to say? I'm like, no, Guillermo, you don't know anything about ghouls. You can't design this. So no, of course it was, so he had kind of sent me his ideas and I, we went back and forth, but I loved them. I loved kind of what he was doing. And the best part for me is I really like to have a kind of a handshake between um, uh, practical and digital. Um, in particular, I like having something on set that the actors can interact with um, while at the same time having VFX involved early so that they kind of, we can see where they're going to be enhancing or tweaking. And so with the ghoul in particular, that was a puppet, um, this amazing puppet uh, that uh, was on the set um, and was moving around and doing all its things. And the hair is all real and it's, you know, it's mouth and eyes. And, and Guillermo is very, very involved in the, he loves getting into the guts of these things. So the servos that are controlling the eyes and the mouth and the tongue, that's, it's Guillermo. Guillermo's in there helping to build these things. And so um, it was really fun to be able to have that on set to each of these, the witch, all these things real in camera. And then afterwards be able to play with kind of the digital tools that enhance and kind of give us extra atmospheric pieces to these things. 
Sure. Uh, you, you know, practical is, is the best way to sell anything, uh, especially in horror. And uh, between you and uh, Vincenzo, who I was talking to earlier, you've both nailed it with your, your practical effects in your. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They were, they were fun. So uh, before I let you go, speaking of Guillermo, I love his opening monologues for every episode, but I love that he, al he also has little statues of you all. Yes. <laughs> and I'm curious, you know, when did you first learn that was going to happen? And what was your first reaction like when you heard he was making little statues of everybody? <laughs> you know, it was in uh, post-production and it was, uh, you know, it was fairly far along. I mean, we'd, we'd, uh, I believe the score had been delivered and a lot of the effects and, uh, Trying to remember how 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 he told me. I think it was. You know what it honestly was. It was a. They told me that there were. I had a. There was a surprise in the mail, um, and sure enough, this box came with the little figurine. And uh, and then after that, I was able to see the opening sequence and kind of see Guillermo pull it out of his pocket and put it down. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was. It, you know, it's very flattering and funny. Um, and I just, you know, I, it's just one of Guillermo's things. Again, it's just the the pride and the amount of involvement he has. The guy doesn't sleep, you know. I mean, he's just so involved in these things. And at the same time that he's truly trusting us, the directors, to kind of deliver on these projects, it was a kind of beautiful gesture that he made these made these things. And, uh, you know, these little chess piece people that uh, that 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 appear in the intro. It's fun. I love that you get that little extra souvenir. Uh, at the <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. and, and I love that he he gave each and every director credit at the beginning. You know, that's that's a rare thing in anything nowadays, especially in anthology. So it's wonderful to get to see you all credited accordingly. Um, yeah, it's a true collaboration for sure. I love it. So Keith, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I can't all wait right. to spread the word about this. Awesome. Awesome. Well, take it easy. Thanks. You too. Have a good weekend. Yep. Bye-bye.